Some Reflections on the Loss of the Titanic by Joseph Conrad It is with a certain bitterness that one must admit to oneself that the late Titanic had a good press. It is perhaps because I have no great practice of daily newspapers, I have never seen so many of them together lying about my room, that the white spaces and the big lettering of the headlines have an incongruously festive air to my eyes, a disagreeable effect of a feverish exploitation of a sensational godsend. And if ever a loss at sea fell under the definition, in the terms of a bill of lading, of act of God, this one does, in its magnitude, suddenness, and severity, and in the chastening influence it should have on the self-confidence of mankind. I say this with all the seriousness the occasion demands, though I have never the competence nor the wish to take a theological view of this great misfortune, sending so many souls to their last account, it is but a natural reflection. Another one flowing also from the phraseology of bills of lading. A bill of lading is a shipping document, limiting in certain of its clauses the liability of the carrier, is that the king's enemy of a more or less overt sort are not altogether sorry that this fatal mishap should strike the prestige of the greatest merchant service in the world. I believe that not a thousand miles from these shores certain public prints have betrayed in Gothic letters their satisfaction, so to speak, by rather ill-natured comments. In what light one is to look at the action of the American Senate is more difficult to say. From a certain point of view, the sight of the august senators of a great power rushing to New York and beginning to bully and badger the luckless Yamsey on the very quay side, so to speak, seems to furnish the Shakespearean touch of the comic to the real tragedy of the fatuous drowning of all these people who to the last moment put their trust in mere bigness and the reckless affirmations of commercial men and mere technicians and the irresponsible paragraphs of the newspapers booming these ships. Yes, a great touch of comedy. One asks oneself what these men are after with this provincial display of authority. I beg my friends in the United States, pardon for calling these zealous senators men. I don't wish to be disrespectful. They may be of the stature of demigods, for all I know, but all that great distance from the shores of the effete Europe, and in the presence of so many guileless dead, their size seems diminished from this side. What are they after? What is there for them to find out? We know what happened. The ship scraped her side against a piece of ice, and sank after floating for two hours and a half, taking a lot of people down with her. What more can they find out from the unfair badgering of the unhappy Yamsey, or the ruffinly abuse of the same. Yamsey, I should explain, is a mere code address, and I use it here symbolically. I have seen commerce pretty close. I know what it is worth, and I have no particular regard for commercial magnates, but one must protest against these bumble-like proceedings. Is it indignation at the loss of so many lives which is at work here? Well, the American railroads kill very many people during one single year, I dare say. Then why don't these dignitaries come down on the presidents of their own railroads, of which one can't say whether they are mere means of transportation or a sort of gambling game for the use of American plutocrats? Is it only an ardent and, upon the whole, praiseworthy desire for information? But the reports of the inquiry tell us what the august senators, though raising a lot of questions, testifying to the complete innocence and even blankness of their minds, are unable to understand what the second officer is saying to them. We are so informed by the press from the other side. Even such a simple expression as that, 
one of the lookout men who was stationed in the eyes of the ship was too much for the senators of the land of graphic expression. What it must have been in the more recondite matters I won't even try to think, because I have no mind for smiles just now. They were greatly exercised about the sound of explosions, heard when half the ship was under water already. Was there one? Was there two? They seemed to be smelling a rat there. Has not some charitable soul told them, what even schoolboys who read sea stories know, that when a ship sinks from a leak like this, a deck or two is always blown up, and that when a steamship goes down by the head, the boilers may, and often do, break adrift with a sound which resembles the sound of an explosion. And they may, indeed, explode, for all I know. In the only case I have seen of a steamship sinking, there was such a sound. But I didn't dive down after her to investigate. She was not of 45,000 tons, and declared unsinkable. But the sight was impressive enough. I shall never forget the muffled, mysterious detonation, the sudden agitation of the sea round the slowly raised stern, and to this day I have in my eye the propeller seen perfectly still in its frame against a clear evening sky. But perhaps the second officer has kept to them, by this time, this and a few other little facts. Though why an officer of the British Merchant Service should answer the questions of any king, emperor, autocrat, or senator of any foreign power as to an event in which a British ship alone was concerned, and which did not even take place in the territorial waters of that power, passes my understanding. The only authority he is bound to answer is the Board of Trade. But with what face the Board of Trade which, having made the regulations for 10,000-ton ships, puts its dear old bald head under its wing for ten years, took it out only to shelve an important report, and with a dreary murmur, unsinkable, put it back again. And the hope of not being disturbed for another ten years, with what face it will be putting questions to that man who has done his duty, as to the facts of this disaster and as to his professional conduct in it, well, I don't know. I have the greatest respect for our established authorities. I am a disciplined man, and I have a natural indulgence for the weaknesses of human institutions. But I will own that at times I have regretted their, how shall I say it, their imponderability. A board of trade, what is it? A board of... I believe the Speaker of the Irish Parliament is one of the members of it. A ghost. Less than that, as yet a mere memory, an officer with adequate and no doubt comfortable furniture and a lot of perfectly irresponsible gentlemen who exist, packed in its equable atmosphere, softly, as in a lot of cotton wool, and with no care in the world, for there can be no care without personal responsibility, for such, for instance, as the seamen have, those seamen from whose mouths this irresponsible institution can take away the bread as a disciplinary measure. Yes, it's all that. And what more? The name of a politician, a party man, less than nothing, a mere void without as much as a shadow of responsibility cast into it from that light in which move the masses of men who work, who deal in things and face the realities, not the words of this life. Years ago I remember overhearing two genuine shellbacks of the old type commenting on a ship's officer who, if not exactly incompetent, did not commend himself to their severe judgment of accomplished sailormen. Said one, resuming and concluding the discussion in a funnily judicial tone, the Board of Trade must have been drunk when they gave him his certificate. I confess that this notion of the Board of Trade as an entity having a brain which could be overcome by the fumes of strong liquor charmed me exceedingly, for then it would have been 
unlike the limited companies of which some exasperated wit has once said that they had no souls to be saved and no bodies to be kicked, and thus were free in this world and the next from all the effective sanctions of conscious conduct. But unfortunately, the picturesque pronouncement overheard by me was only a characteristic sally of an annoyed sailor. The Board of Trade is composed of bloodless departments. It has no limbs and no physiognomy, or else at the forthcoming inquiry it might have paid to the victims of the Titanic disaster the small tribute of a blush. I ask myself whether the Marine Department of the Board of Trade did really believe when they decided to shelve the report on equipment for a time that a ship of 45,000 tons, that any ship could be made practically indestructible by means of watertight bulkheads. It seems incredible to anybody who had ever reflected upon the properties of material such as wood or steel. You can't let builders say what they like, make a ship of such dimensions as strong proportionately as a much smaller one. The shocks our old sailors had to stand amongst the heavy flows in Baffin's Bay were perfectly staggering, notwithstanding the most skillful handling, and yet they lasted for years. The Titanic, if one believes the last reports, has only scraped against a piece of ice, which I suspect was not an enormously bulky and comparatively easily seen berg, but the low edge of a flow, and sank, leisurely enough, God knows, and here the advantages of bulkheads comes in, for time is a great friend, a good helper, though in this lamentable case these bulkheads served only to prolong the agony of the passengers who could not be saved. But she sank, causing apart from the sorrow and the pity of the loss of so many lives a sort of surprised consternation that such a thing should have happened at all. Why? You build a 45,000 ton hotel of thin steel plates to secure the patronage of, say, a couple of thousand rich people, for it had been for the emigrant trade alone there would have been no such exaggeration of mere size. You decorated in the style of the pharaohs, or in the Louis Quinze style, I don't know which, and to please the aforesaid fatuous handful of individuals who have more money than they know what to do with, and to the applause of two continents, you launch that ship with 2,000 people on board at 21 knots across the sea, a perfect exhibition of the modern blind trust in mere material and appliances. And then this happens. General uproar. The blind trust in material and appliances has received a terrible shock. I will say nothing of the credulity which accepts any statement which specialists, technicians, and office people are pleased to make, whether for purposes of gain or glory. You stand there astonished and hurt in your profoundest sensibilities. But what else, under the circumstances, could you expect? For my part, I could much sooner believe in an unsinkable ship of 3,000 tons than in one of 40,000 tons. You can't increase the thickness of scantling and plates indefinitely, and the mere weight of this bigness is an added disadvantage. In reading the reports, the first reflection which occurs to one is that, if that luckless ship had been a couple of hundred feet shorter, she would have probably gone clear of the danger. But then, perhaps, she could not have had a swimming bath and a French café. That, of course, is a serious consideration. I am well aware that those responsible for her short and fatal existence ask us in desolate accents to believe that if she had hit and on, she would have survived, which, by a sort of coy implication, seems to mean that it was all the fault of the officer of the watch, he is dead now, for trying to avoid the obstacle. 
We shall have presently, in deference to commercial and industrial interests, a new kind of seamanship, a very new and progressive kind. If you see anything in the way, by no means try to avoid it, smash it at full tilt, and then, and then only, you shall see the triumph of material, of clever contrivances, of the whole box of engineering tricks, in fact, and cover with a glory a commercial concern of the most unmitigated sort, a great trust in accordance with the new seamanship. Everything's in that, and doubtless the Board of Trade, as properly approached, would consent to give the needed instructions to its examiners of masters and mates. Behold the examination room of the future. Enter to the grizzled examiner a young man of modest aspect. Are you well up in modern seamanship? I hope so, sir. Hmm, let's see. You are at night on the bridge in charge of a 150,000 ton ship with a motor track, organ loft, etc., etc., with a full cargo of passengers, a full crew of 1,500 cafe waiters, two sailors, and a boy, three collapsible boats as per Board of Trade regulations, and going at your three-quarter speed of, say, about 40 knots. You perceive suddenly, right ahead, and close to, something that looks like a large ice floe. What would you do? Put the helm amidships. Very well. Why? In order to hit end on. On what grounds would you endeavor to hit end on? Because we are taught by our builders and masters that the heavier the smash, the smaller the damage. And because the requirements of material should be attended to. And so on and so on. The new seamanship, when in doubt, try to ram fairly whatever before you. Very simple. If only the Titanic had rammed that piece of ice, which was not a monstrous berg, fairly, every puffing paragraph would have been vindicated in the eyes of the credulous public which pays. But would it? Well, I doubt it. I am well aware that in the 80s the steamship Arizona, one of the greyhounds of the ocean and the jargons of that day, did run bows on against a very unmistakable iceberg and managed to get into port on her collision bulkhead. But the Arizona was not, if I remember rightly, 5,000 tons register, let alone 45,000 tons. And she was not going at 20 knots per hour. I can't be perfectly certain at this distance of time, but her sea speed could have not been more than 14 at the outside. Both these facts made for safety, and if she had been engined to go 20 knots, there would not have been behind that speed the enormous mass, so difficult to check in its impetus, the terrific weight of which is bound to do damage to itself or others at the slightest contact. I assure you it is not for the vain pleasure of talking about my own poor experiences, but only to illustrate my point and I will relate here a very unsensational little incident I witnessed now rather more than 20 years ago in Sydney. Ships were beginning then to grow bigger year after year, though of course the present dimensions were not even dreamt of. I was standing on the circular quay with a Sydney pilot watching a big mail steamship of one of our best-known companies being brought alongside. We admired her lines, her noble appearance, and were impressed by her size as well, though her length, I imagine, was hardly half that of the Titanic. She came into the cove, as that part of the harbor is called, of course very slowly, and at some hundred feet or so, short of the quay, lost her way. That quay was then a wooden one, a fine structure of many piles and stringers bearing a roadway, a thing of great strength. The ship, as I have said before, stopped moving when some hundred feet from it. Then her engines were rung on slow ahead and immediately rung off again. The propeller made just about five turns, I should say. She began to move, stealing on, so to speak, without a ripple, 
coming alongside with the utmost gentleness. I went on looking her over, very much interested, but the man with me, the pilot, muttered under his breath, too much, too much. His exercise judgment had warned him of what I did not suspect, but I believe that neither of us was exactly prepared for what happened. There was a faint concussion of the ground under our feet, a groaning of piles, a snapping of great iron bolts, and with a sound of ripping and splintering, as when a tree is blown down by the wind, a great strong piece of wood, a bulk of squared timber, was displaced several feet as if by enchantment. I looked at my companion in amazement. I could not have believed it, I declared. No, he said. You would not have thought she would have cracked an egg, eh? I certainly wouldn't have thought that. He shook his head and added, Eh, these great big things, they want some handling. Some months afterwards, I was back in Sydney. The same pilot brought me in from sea, and I found the same steamship, or else another as like her as two peas, lying at anchor not far from us. The pilot told me she had arrived the day before and that he was to take her alongside tomorrow. I reminded him jocularly of the damage to the quay. Oh, he said, we are not allowed now to bring them in under their own steam. We are using tugs. A very wise regulation, and this is my point, that size is, to a certain extent, an element of weakness. The bigger the ship, the more delicately she must be handled. Here is a contact which, in the pilot's own words, wouldn't think could have cracked an egg, with the astonishing result of something like eighty feet of good strong wooden quay shaken loose, iron bolts snapped, a bulk of stout timber splintered. Now suppose that quay had been of granite, as surely it is now, or instead of the quay, if they had been, say, a North Atlantic fog there with a full-grown iceberg in it awaiting the gentle contact of a ship, groping its way along blindfolded. Something would have been hurt, but it would not have been the iceberg. Apparently, there is a point in development when it ceases to be a true progress, in trade, in games, in the marvelous handiwork of men, and even in their demands and desires and aspirations of the moral and mental kind. There is a point when progress, to remain a real advance, must change slightly the direction of its lines. But this is a wide question. What I wanted to point out here is that the old Arizona, the marvel of her day, was proportionately stronger, handier, better equipped than this triumph of modern naval architecture, the loss of which, in common parlance, will remain the sensation of this year. The clatter of the presses has been worthy of the tonnage of the preliminary paeans of triumph round that vanished hull, of the reckless statements and elaborate descriptions of its ornate splendor, a great babble of news, and what sort of news too, good heavens, and eager comment has arisen around this catastrophe though it seems to me that a less strident note would have been more becoming in the presence of so many victims left struggling on the sea, of lives miserably thrown away for nothing, or worse than nothing, for false standards of achievement, to satisfy a vulgar demand of a few moneyed people for a banal hotel luxury, the only one they can understand, and because the big ship pays, in one way or another, in money or in advertising value. It is in more ways than one a very ugly business, and a mere scrape along the ship's side so slight that, if reports are to believe, it, it did not interrupt a card party in the gorgeously fitted, but in chaste style, smoking room, or was it in the delightful French café, is enough to bring on the exposure. All the people on board existed under a sense of false security. How false it has been sufficiently demonstrated. 
and the fact which seems undoubted that some of them actually were reluctant to enter the boats when told to do so shows the strength of that falsehood. Incidentally, it shows also the sort of discipline on board these ships, the sort of hold kept on the passengers in the face of the unforgiving sea. These people seem to imagine it an optional matter, whereas the order to leave the ship should be an order of the sternest character, to be obeyed unquestioningly and promptly by every one on board, with men to enforce it at once, and carry it out methodically and swiftly. And it is no use to say it cannot be done, for it can, it has been done. The only requisite is manageableness of the ship herself, and of the numbers she carries on board. That is the great thing which makes for safety. A commander should be able to hold his ship, and everything on board of her, in the hollow of his hand, as it were. But with modern foolish trust in materials, and with those floating hotels, that has become impossible. A man may do his best, but he cannot succeed in a task which from greed, or more likely from sheer stupidity, has been made too great for anybody's strength. The readers of the English Review, who cast a friendly eye nearly six years ago on my reminiscences, and know how much the merchant service, ships and men, has been to me, will understand my indignation that those men whom, speaking in no sentimental phrase, but in the very truth of feeling, I can even now think otherwise than as brothers, have been put by their commercial employers in the impossibility to perform efficiently their plain duty, and this from motives which I shall not enumerate here, but whose intrinsic unworthiness is plainly revealed by the greatness, the miserable greatness of that disaster. Some of them have perished. To die for commerce is hard enough, but to go under that sea we have been trained to combat with a sense of failure and the supreme duty of one's calling is indeed a bitter fate. Thus they are gone, and the responsibility remains with the living who will have no difficulty in replacing them by others, just as good, at the same wages. It was their bitter fate. But I, who can look at some arduous years when their duty was my duty too, and their feelings were my feelings, can remember some of us who once upon a time were more fortunate. 